Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to take a look at another 13F filing, but this is gonna be of Monish Perbrai. He runs a portfolio of around $300 million, and we're gonna take a look at his 13F filing as of the end of Q2 2022, which just came out in the last couple of days. And uh, Monish Perbrai is one of the more probably popular investors, I would say, especially in the YouTube arena. When it comes to value investing, if you don't know much about this guy, I would definitely go check out uh, YouTube videos of him. He has no problem going and talking to universities around the world. He also has talked to even individual channels. I think Everything Money had him on it at some point too. Uh, and he's just a, a funny guy to listen to overall, but uh, uh, definitely brilliant. I think from, I think the early 2000s through like 2010 or 11, he had around a 26% rate of return on his portfolio, which is just absolutely incredible overall. So I always like to look to see what he's investing in because uh, he also has some really good value investors that are other hedge fund managers that he uh, collaborates with from Guy Spear, uh, Lee Lu, he knows Warren Buffett, uh, Charlie Munger as well. So I am always interested to see what he has in his portfolio. Now, if this is the first video watched of mine, my name is Justin. I'm an accountant. I've been an accountant for almost 20 years now. Uh, recently, I moved over to finance and I do financial planning and analysis. And I try to use my, my background in accounting and finance on bringing value to you guys when I look at different uh, stocks and looking at the stock market. So a lot of videos I do are actually doing deep dives into stocks, but this is the time of the year where I really do a deep dive into portfolios and a hedge fund manager portfolio. So we're gonna take a look at Mullins for Brian. We're gonna do that right now. Basically what I'm gonna do in this video is kind of start his smallest position and then kind of the work the way up. Now, keep in mind, I usually use Dataroma and pull the information from there as far as what's in hedge fund managers portfolios, but Dataroma only shows 13F filings, which are from uh, stocks that are on the American Stock Exchange. And Monish Pabrai invests in stocks all around the world. In fact, I think, well, he only owns two stocks right now that are on the American Stock Exchange. All the rest of them are around the world. So just keep that in mind. I'm pulling this information from Ticker Terminal. If you're interested in that platform, I do have a link down below if you want to check it out, support the channel, or um, or if, even if you just go get the free version of it, I think it's it's a fantastic platform overall. And it shows not just 13F filings, but other filings um, as well there too. So I started the smallest one, then worked the way up from there. So the, the smallest one he has in his portfolio is Heritage Growth Properties. Ticker symbol SRG. Now he has been selling off this position, so he sold off another 15,000 shares. He only has 3,000 shares left in his portfolio as of the end of this last quarter, and he's been heavily selling off since the beginning of this year. And this seems kind of bad timing. I, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but I certainly can. When you buy a stock, you hold it for a while, um, and the reason you're holding it uh, you know, might be you think it's gonna the, the stock is probably undervalued, right? And you think it's going to recover over time or have some really gro gro big growth opportunities. SRG is a little unique where the value of their portfolio, and when I say portfolio, it's a REIT company, it owns a bunch of different properties. Really, the, the old Sears properties, uh, so Sears went bankrupt, they spun Sears' growth properties out from that. And so they owned all these old uh, Sears properties and uh, they're in really prime locations, especially a few of those. And so they're basically rebuilding those or, you know, the land they're building new buildings on or re updating some of the buildings and then renting those out. Uh, and the thought was that they would sell some of these like non-profitable, you know, land or buildings. And then, uh, then they would kind of revamp these other ones and then, you know, it would, uh, do well over time. And unfortunately, it hasn't gone according to plan. But the really X factor about this company is that if you add up all the, the land and the buildings on top of it, it's actually worth more than what the company is worth. And so the idea is even if it didn't work out and they had to sell off their properties, that you know, as an investor, a shareholder, you could actually get more money back because of their net asset value of all these properties. Uh, and actually, they just announced here recently that they're going to start selling off all these properties and, and really liquidating the company. So uh, there's a lot of debate on what that is. I've seen anywhere from $15 to $25 a share. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of see where it kind of plays out, but it looks like he's just getting out of it completely. Uh, next one up is Shinikin. This is a company in Japan. 
What's interesting is that um, this has not been updated since the end of last year. So um, I think maybe he's not a 5% shareholder anymore. So when he was a 5% shareholder of Shinnekin, uh, they, you know, there was a special re, re, um, re, reporting requirement that he had, so it would get updated in ticker terminal. And since he's been selling off his shares, he's gone less than five percent. So he may not own Shinnekin anymore. I don't know. If, if someone knows more about that, drop it down below. Um, but as of the end of last year, it was about one percent of his portfolio. Uh, next up, which was uh, really his biggest um, addition, and he already owned this company, but this is Rain Industries. And this is a company he added 1.7 million shares to. And I thought this was kind of interesting because he, I, I think he's been selling a lot of these shares. Um, and now all of a sudden he's adding to it. So maybe something changed uh, from his point of view um, because now it's worth about 4% of his portfolio. He increased it by 32% the amount of shares that he owned. And that was kind of his big buy um, in the quarter overall. The next up is nice holdings and this is a company that is about five percent of his portfolio and he's been selling uh he sold about 28 percent of that position about three hundred and eighty thousand shares in total and right now it's only worth about five percent of his portfolio uh next up is racist hopefully that i'm saying that right uh, or Rhesus, um, but uh, this is a company that he owns almost, or his portfolio is about 9% of his portfolio, about 74 million shares, uh, no change in that position at all, did not buy or sell. Uh, next up is Edelweiss Financial Services, 15% of his portfolio, 60 million shares. Next one up is SunTech Realty. It's about 20% of his portfolio, 9 million shares, and again, nothing there, no selling or buying. And then his biggest position in his portfolio is Micron Technology, secret so symbol MU. And this is the one that I was really, really curious to see what he was going to do with. Uh, Micron, you know, it, it is a chip maker. If you don't know much about them, they're in, actually an oligopoly industry, which means there's very few competitors. They make memory chips. So they're not competitors of, say, like Intel, for example. Their main competitors are Samsung and SK, which are both in, in South Korea. And Micron, 73% of the revenue comes from DRAM chips. The other part comes from NAND chips. But their DRAM chips, again, are 73% of their revenue, but they're the only DRAM producer in the United States, which I think does give them advantage, especially, you know, with the kind of shipping issues that we've kind of seen over the last year or so should help Micron overall. It's a very cyclical industry. So him and Lee Liu got together a couple of years ago and they both bought in. There's a lot of other value investors that have bought in as well. David Tepper, Guy Spear, for example, as well. And and Lee Liu and uh, Guy, Guy Spear and Monish Pabrai have been holding this stock. Um, David Tepper has been selling, but he's been selling a lot of stocks <laughs> uh, since October overall. So I was interesting to see what he was going to do with this position. Is he still very bullish on it? Um, Cause he's pretty much stood pat. I think he started buying this. I want to say at the end of 2018 or going into 2019, somewhere around there. Uh, but he's been holding for a long time and it's his largest position. Now, one stock that's not on this list and uh, I'm pretty sure that he owns cause he talked about it many times is uh, Tencent. Now, we don't know if he owns Tencent directly or if he bought Naspers uh, or if he bought Prosys. Uh, and uh, and the, kind of the idea behind that is so Tencent is a very large, in fact, it's the largest uh, internet company in China. Uh, I think the second one is, is Alibaba. But Tencent is a huge conglomerate out there in China. And uh, uh, Naspers, which is located in South Africa, bought a huge stake. Like they own 33% of, of Tencent and that stake grew over time to billions and billions of dollars. I mean, just an incredible uh, amount of money that that grew too. And then they, you know, shareholders of Naspers have looked at situations and said, well, your stake of Tencent is actually worth more than your entire company. You should start selling that stock. And they've tried to do different things. And unfortunately, it just has not... Uh, helped with their, their market cap. And the reason is they're the largest company in South Africa. So they don't have a whole lot of room to grow. So they created this other company of process, which trades off the answer dam exchange in Europe. And they're trying to kind of create value through process and process just here recently announced that they're going to, you know, basically sell off a bunch of 10 cent stake and then 
uh, buyback shares uh, doing that. So it's kind of an interesting proposition. Uh, there's another guy, Rob Vinal, who I've done a lot of videos on. In fact, just recently I did a portfolio update on him. Actually, Moish Pabrai read Rob Vinal's letter. Um, that was uh, one of his uh, high convictions that he, he reason why he bought in, into Micron. Um, but uh, kind of interesting. So there's, uh, and he was in Alibaba at one point too, but sold out of that. But if there's any other stocks you guys know of that's not on this list that Moish Pabrai has talked about or you know that he owns, Drop it down in the comment section, but other than, like, say, process, I, I think this covers um, all of them overall. And then, again, Shinikan, it's hard to say what's left in his portfolio just because that's not reported anymore. So he may have sold out. I'm not sure at that time. But that's that's most probably in a nutshell. Now, if there's another video that you want me to do on another hedge fund manager, uh, specifically maybe a value investor, uh, throw it down in, in the description below. Uh, I'll be talking about Seth Klarman here uh, shortly as well. And um, I just did Rob Vinal here recently and uh, Guy Spear as well. And I'll be rolling out more as they come out too. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll catch you on the other side. Take care and God bless.